Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Wynne Bowen. I am one of the two co-directors of the Freeman Air and Space Institute here at King's, alongside my other co-director, David Jordan, um, uh, over the other side of the, uh, the, the stage here. So welcome to Bush House um, from us all at King's and from the Freeman Institute. It's a great pleasure to be hosting, once again, our annual event with the Chief of the Air Staff. Um, and many thanks indeed to uh, Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston for, for joining us again uh, tonight. Very quickly on admin, so the fire exits are clearly marked at the top and at the bottom. If you hear the alarm, then head for the exits, and there are also uh, the fire marshals and follower King's member of staff, but it's pretty clear uh, how to get out if we have to do that. Um, I'm sure most of you know at least something about the Freeman Institute, uh, but let me say a quick few uh, words. Uh, we're part of the School of Security Studies here at King's College London, and we were established in 2020 thanks to a generous uh, Thanks to generous funding from the Royal Air Force through the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. Um, as a university organisation, of course, um, the Institute's independent of the RAF, um, and our role is very much one of, of, of a critical friend. So we seek to inform policy, doctrinal and scholarly debates related to air and space issues. Um, and of course, this is all happening at the moment in a rapidly changing strategic environment, characterised in part by, by transformative technological change, of course. So we place a priority on identifying, developing and cultivating air and space thinkers, whether that's in academia, whether that's in government, industry, and of course within the armed forces uh, themselves, uh, as well as seeking to inform and equip air and space education provision, both at King's and, and further afield. And as part of that, we're also dedicated to diversity, inclusion and widening participation in the air and space uh, field. So if anyone wants to talk about those issues, come to me. We regularly hold events like the one this evening, um, and we publish the Freeman paper series, um, recent examples of which include the challenges of the RAF's return to the Arctic, written by Aaron Dawson. Uh, we've had something recently on drones in the Ukraine conflict um, uh, by Julia Moravska, Mar and also Julia Baum from Freeman recently wrote about mediating space security. Um, so turning to this evening, um, instead of a lecture format this year, uh, tonight is an in-conversation event uh, with Cass, uh, reflecting on his career and the experience of commanding the Royal Air Force during a, a very significant time, marked by the pandemic and several prime ministers, uh, to say the least. Um, Caroline Wyatt has joined us from the BBC, uh, and she's kindly agreed to conduct the conversation uh, this evening with Cass. Um, Caroline spent almost two decades, as people probably know, reporting on global affairs as a foreign correspondent based in various places, Germany, France, uh, Russia, and has covered a range of conflicts from Kosovo, uh, Chechnya, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and so forth. She was BBC Defence Correspondent from 2007 to 2014, uh, and after a period covering global religious, religious affairs, uh, Caroline now works as the presenter of BBC Radio 4 Saturday PM News and Current Affairs programme. And recently, uh, her most recent documentary was on Radio 4, looking at Afghan war uh, veterans uh, back in April. So, thanks for coming. It's going to be a great event. I'll hand over to Caroline. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. And it's an immense pleasure to be here tonight. Can you hear me on this microphone? Good. Um, it's a building that, as we arrived tonight, I remembered as being far less glamorous than it is now, because I arrived here as a terrified BBC trainee in the very dusty World Service newsroom that was based here at Bush House. And it is a real pleasure to be speaking to the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston, this evening. Not least because King's is where you studied for your MA. That was in Defence Studies. You'd already joined the RF by then. You'd become a tornado pilot in 92, and this was all before you went on to command 12 Squadron, a 903 Expeditionary Air Wing in Basra, and later becoming Director of Air Operations at ISAF in Afghanistan. And I was curious, what made you join the RAF? I joined the RAF uh, out of a passion for aviation. And so there was no higher uh, patriotic um, motivations. I, I'm almost ashamed to admit. I think that, that came later. But, um, th but from a, as, as a small child, absolutely fascinated by aviation, things that fly. And, uh, and I spent my teenage years obsessing about being a fighter pilot and, and I was fortunate enough to pass the tests and be able to do it and had an incredibly rewarding career as a, as a tornado pilot and squadron commander as you say and then one day I became more valuable to the Air Force as a bureaucrat than as a pilot and, uh, and, that, and that, that has shaped the, the second half of my career. 
And did you have a role model as you progressed through all of those leadership roles, whether that was someone within the RAF or outside? I, I with, with hindsight, there was no single role model. That, and I think it's probably the same experience for most people in, in the Air Force, the, the Army and the Navy. But, but what we have is a succession of amazing leaders. And, and you learn so much from the people around you, but the people you work for. And, and, and they're not always great leaders. Sometimes uh, you know, they're, you know, people have, have shortcomings, and you learn from those as well. But I think a succession of people at, at varying ranks who have done things that I've looked at and said, I, I, I would really like a chance to do that, or that's really a fascinating role, and that's something that I, that, that I, that I should aspire to. So it's been, uh, it's been inspiration step by step, I think, rather than one driving um, uh, role model to follow. Wynne alluded to the last few years. I mean, you took over as Chief of the Air Staff in those gloriously calm days of 2019, so before the pandemic, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I think it was either three or even four prime ministers ago. So just as the UK was heading into some real social and political turbulence, what, what advice would you now have given yourself then? Um, and in that mix, I would throw in a, a strategic review, the integrated review, and I'd throw the evacuation from Afghanistan, from Kabul, um, some real unexpected moments, and a, a recognition that Above all, an organisation, a defence organisation, a military organisation like the Royal Air Force needs to have a degree of resilience for those shocks. And that resilience comes from a bit of planning and preparation and thinking through the contingency plans. It comes from having the right equipment in the right place and, and again, thinking through what you need, sometimes decades in advance. But above all, it requires talented people and uh, people with the skills and the leaders in particular who are able to lead their teams at, at whatever level in the organization through those shocks and, and I think when I think of what was achieved in Kabul last summer so 18 months ago uh, within with only weeks of notice we were or less than that even we were mounting the largest airlift operation since Berlin in the uh, in the in the post Second World War years. We uh, we uh, over two very frantic weeks we we extracted 15,000 people from Afghanistan, far more than we were expecting to, as part of a massive international effort. We helped um, just under 40 countries and flew dozens and dozens of, of missions in that time, and and that was all down to the. The, uh, the crews, the, the, the British Army doing the cordon to get people through, and that was just achieved by, by local leadership. And it wasn't something we'd planned for at that scale. We certainly hadn't planned for it at that kind of pace, but it happened, and it happened because the organisation had the resilience to cope with it. And I think whether, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's operational shocks like that, whether it's facing up to those signals from Russia, those signals that we've seen for over a decade now of an increasingly malevolent, brutal, aggressive regime that was that that, that was determined to uh, pursue political aims through uh, the use of force through invading sovereign countries, that, that brutal invasion of Ukraine. All of those signals were there and it's a matter of how much you prepare for them and, and, and how much resilience you've got in your organisation to deal with them. And talking of resilience, as you say, one of the greatest challenges for democracies now, not just for us, but is how do we deal with what's happening in Ukraine? What, what for you have been the lessons of the war in Ukraine for air power? There have been some enduring lessons of air power, some, some of those qualities of air power that we talk about in academic institutions over the years the importance of control of the air. But we've seen, we've seen what happens when you have control of the air, and we've also seen what happens when you don't have control of the air. And, and in essence, what you've got in Ukraine at the moment is a bit of a stalemate in terms of control of the air. The Russians haven't got the freedom to employ air power, nor do the Ukrainians. And what that results in is 
uh, intense artillery barrages, some of the, the hideous conditions that we've seen on the ground that, uh, that the Ukrainian civili civilian population has, has suffered. But it's also meant that Russia hasn't been able to bring uh, to bear its, its, its uh, large armoured forces, its army, in a way that you would think the numbers would tell you it would be able to. So control of the air matters. Now, we don't need control of the air, sort of ubiquitous control of the air, like, like we've enjoyed for the last 30 years in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's, that's, that's probably asking too much in, in the current uh, context with very sophisticated surface-to-air missiles and air-to-air um, and, and air -air, uh, missiles as well. So, so, so but, but the important thing is to be able to, uh, to uh, get, get control of the air at the time and place of your choosing. Some very dramatic backing music here. Um, and, uh, but, um, but, but to get control of the air at the time and place of your choosing, because then you have the freedom of manoeuvre on the ground or, or, um, or at sea. I think the, the other significant lesson, and it's a reminder for us, is that almost as important as control of the air is control of the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's something that a lot of us are looking at now in the way that both sides in Ukraine are using it to their advantage. Everything from information operations all the way through to, some, uh, to, to, to energy weapons. And then the other thing which is increasingly playing a part in the Ukrainian conflict is, is space and, and the, the role of the space domain. Through space, Ukraine has, has been able to stay in touch with the world. We've given us, it's given us the insight into what's going on on the ground, which, uh, so to dispel some of the Russian propaganda, it's given us, uh, it's given the Ukrainians intelligence. And a large part of that has been achieved by linking up with commercial space service providers in a very agile way. And there's something in that for all of us to, to take note of and to, to recognize the uh, the advantages it brings, but also, to an extent, the limitations as well. If you are if you are dealing with a um, capricious commercial provider, if I can put it in those terms. And have you seen improved dialogue, collaboration across Europe and within NATO? From a from an air perspective, I think the the way that NATO air forces came together under the command of the head, the NATO headquarters in Ramstein was exemplary. We we started as chiefs, so all of the NATO air chiefs came together on a weekly basis from the beginning of the year as we started to sort of read what was likely to happen. And our planning staff put together a plan for us to, to be able to protect NATO airspace and NATO territory. Because whilst we were pretty clear in our mind what Russia's intentions for that unprovoked illegal invasion of Ukraine were, we, we didn't know to what extent it would expand or escalate beyond those initial aims. And there was the prospect of Russia rolling right through Ukraine uh, in a brutal, brutally overwhelming fashion and be at the, be at the borders of NATO with, a, with an armoured force with momentum. So, so by, on, on night one and, in the, and uh, in the immediate aftermath of the invasion on, the, on February the 24th, we had NATO combat air patrols all the way from the north of Norway all the way down to the Black Sea, all coordinated by the air operations centres and, and by Air Command in Ramstein, and, and, and airborne for 24 hours. A, a huge effort, largely unseen by our populations with uh, all of the command and control that goes with that, the air-to-air -air refueling, all, all of the, the, uh, the supporting infrastructure that goes with that. But it was a very, very clear message to Putin that there would be a high price to pay for any escalation or expansion of what he was going to do in Ukraine. And, and that message was very evident. And, and I think it, 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 it contributed to that, to that strategic signaling without question of a doubt about the, the sanctity of, of NATO territory and NATO airspace. And, and, I, and I would go so far as to say in those early weeks it was air power that was NATO's manoeuvre force. You know, we, we were the force that was flexing and being able to uh, modulate our, our response to what was going on 
in Afghanistan, uh, in, in Ukraine, without raising the uh, the risk of escalation in in any way. On top of that, it was. Uh, it was reconnaissance platforms that were gathering a lot of really important intelligence uh, right up to and uh, on the on the day before the the um, the invasion of Ukraine we had Royal Air Force rivet joint aircraft flying in Ukrainian airspace and they have subsequently been on the borders of Ukraine ever since on a on a weekly basis and then the air mobility force has night after night Supplied the supplied the vital equipment, so uh, weapons and am, uh, ammunition, and uh, food and medical aid to keep Ukraine in the fight. And we've been flying it into into Eastern Europe to, to, to for them to be sort of, uh, handed over to the Ukrainians and sustaining them in the fight. And the Royal Air Force alone has delivered some. 10,000 anti-tank rounds, 3 million small arms, uh, 100,000 artillery shells, armoured vehicles, tens of thousands of body armour kits, and night after night that's continuing. And those are, those are donations coming in from, from the UK, from all around the world, and, it's air, and again it's airlift that, that is sustaining and keeping the, the Ukrainian armed forces in that heroic fight. Do, do you worry about the risks of escalation though? Yes, yes, we do, and 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 I think we have to think through every every step in a very in a very careful way. I I, I applaud our government for being the first government to declare that we were going to help arm the Ukrainians with defensive anti-tank weapons, and we we spoke about it and we delivered it, and and that was uh, at the time that was a, a very bold leadership, you know, political leadership um, position by our government, but other governments followed and, and here we are uh, six, nine months down the road and we are, um, uh, and, uh, and the um, you know, continued support for the Ukrainians through the resupply and uh, giving them uh, uh, ground to air missiles, more anti-tank rounds, armoured armored fighting vehicles. So, so whilst there was a risk of a response and escalation there, again, very carefully thought through, there is, of course, uh, always the risk of uh, miscalculation, in, inadvertent um, acts, uh, reckless acts, and again, this is something that we have to be, be prepared, prepared for, but, but there is a conscious risk of, uh, or a conscious um, recognition that escalation is a risk and so we need to be very careful and that's that's why we've taken the position we have on uh, on some aspects of of resupply of the ukrainians and you'll remember in the early days back in february or march talk about no fly zones and supplying ukraine with combat aircraft and again that would have that, that would have been and probably still is too too escalatory and one thread running ev through everything you've talked about so far is that being prepared for the unexpected and some argue that the RAF of 2018 would have been perfectly recognisable to the chief of the air staff of 1918. Well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I think the uniform is about the same isn't it? Well, how much harder is it for you now and the leaders within the RAF to, to imagine and envisage what on earth the RAF will need to be like in another hundred? Yeah I mean, I mean it, 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 it's a it's a fabulous question, and I'm, I, I hope there are some uh, academics who are sort of thinking through that because that 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 taking the last hundred years and then trying to and then flipping it a hundred years ahead. I mean, that's where, to my mind, that's where the real value of of holding the mirror upon our our past comes in. There were some things that our founding fathers got absolutely right, and, and Lord Trenchard and the senior team around him. That um, when, when you think, and I've described it, and some people will have heard me describe it like this before, that the Royal Air Force was the 20th century's original tech startup. It was it was a group of people working for the Navy and the Army at the time who came across this amazing new technology, understood its unlimited, near unlimited potential, but were frustrated by the way the organization they were part of was responding to it. So they, they rebelled and they had to set up a whole new organization that was 
that was born of the, the army and the navy, but, but that was distinctly different. And the, the work that Trenchard put into, consciously put into creating a culture, creating a different culture, creating a distinctly Royal Air Force culture, has stood the test of time. So there, and so there are threads of what he put in place that we can still see today. There are some things that haven't stood the test of time either, but, but there are many, many things that, that you would recognise and I think have a high likelihood of enduring for another hundred years. What of course has changed beyond imagination, I, and I think uh, when, I, when I look at um, what those, you know, those tiny fragile machines that they were flying in 1918, and then you look only 20 years later as, as, the, as the first of the, of the iconic Second World War fighters started emerging, the Hurricane Spitfire. And then you roll on to where we are today, and um, you know, it's those leaps of technology just go beyond human comprehension. And I think that is where we will struggle to, to pitch what we will be like in 20, 2118. I think we have a pretty good, we can have a pretty good stab of where we'll be in 20 years' time and, uh, and how things will change. But even that, will, there will be things that we'll be doing in 2040 that, we, that probably some people in this audience have, have started to think about, but, but that we are, uh, that are beyond comprehension for the majority of us. And it's those leaps of technology, when you look at the, um, the, the advent of the jet age, that was, uh, the, uh, the advent of radar and some of the electronic technologies, the introduction now of uh, you know, digital design, um, digitally flown platforms. The skills for our, for our people, from air crew all the way through to our you know, technicians, the skills that's required uh, are changing as well. You know, the, I, I, I joined the Air Force in a day when you, you needed those hand-eye, foot coordination skills because you still had to fly things like the tornado. When you look at the F-35 Lightning now, you're, you're a systems operator, still in a very arduous, complex, demanding environment, but you're operating a system uh, and, a, a, and you're interfacing with an incredibly sophisticated, intelligent machine, and, uh, which is quite capable of flying itself. Uh, what you are doing is operating it as a, as, as a, uh, as, as a weapon system, and, and it's the human brain which is, the, which is the key part of that. It's interesting looking ahead to the Air Force of the future. If people, if most of the work will be done by unmanned aerial mm. bit, how do you persuade people to join the RAF if they're not going to fly? Well, we, we, uh, we, we recruit now for people to fly uh, Reaper, and in future that will be the protector. And it's a rich source of, uh, of, of recruit, recruiting. People want to, uh, because it is exciting technology. And for some people who might not have the, uh, might not pass the physical standards to get into a cockpit, you know, their, their legs might be too long or, um, or, you know, or, or, uh, or other you know, aspects. Actually, flying RPAS is as, you know, as close as it gets. I, mean, I, I have, when you look at what our Reaper Force does day in, day out, uh, tackling violent extremists in the Middle East and what they have done for over a decade now. Again, it's a key part of keeping the UK safe and, and the, the righteousness of that for the people involved in those missions is, is, a, is, a, is a motivation in itself before you even think about whether it's an airborne cockpit or a cockpit in a, in a trailer at, in, in Lincolnshire. Uh, so, so I think we will continue to, to attract people who who see the fascination of, of technology that are seized by what these amazing machines we operate can do. The, the, the other rich source of recruiting for us at the moment is space. Now, we're not, we're not going to be launching astronauts anytime soon, but we are, we are bringing in people whose job it will be to protect and defend the United Kingdom in space. And, and that is bringing, that, you know, that again is a fascinating area that the Air Force is expanding into and, and will continue to grow. And it will be something we're doing in 2118, I'm absolutely certain. To come back to the here and now, you'll hand over next year. Mm. Do you worry at all about the size, the numbers of aircraft that you have, <laughs> seven and a half fast jet squadrons? 
the number of pilots that you have. Are you, is that a concern? So, so you were asking the chief of the air staff if I'd like more aeroplanes, Caroline. <laughs> I can't think what the answer will be. I, um, so I, I would, I would, yeah, I would dearly love a a, a larger air force. I, I think, and if if it was the first sea lord sitting here, you know what he'd say, and if it was the chief of the general staff sitting here, you know what we, they would say. But I, um, but we, but we, we recognise that we we exist in a resource constrained environment and so it's really important that we reflect what what that operating envelope is and it's just as important an operating envelope as, as any of those other constraints and boundaries that we have. I, I look at our force now, I look at the amazing things that the, the Typhoon Force has done this year alone and uh, and, and it's, there, there, was, there was one point in August where we had half a typhoon squadron in Australia, we had typhoons in Saudi Arabia and, and Cyprus, we had typhoons in Romania patrolling um, the uh, contributing to NATO air policing, we had typhoons in quick, on quick reaction alert in the UK and in the Falkland Islands, and we had typhoons doing daily uh, uh, strategic messaging sorties into the Baltics and into Scandinavia, uh, exercising with our, our NATO allies there, or soon to be NATO allies there. When, when you look at the scale of presence, that the, 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 the level of operational activity, the global deployment, you, you, we realise that we've got an Air Force which is, which is a truly global Air Force. It's agile, it's able to respond, as I say, to to those strategic shocks, and uh, and we meet the demands of our of our government, and we we are and we remain a benchmark air force that air forces of the world look to for uh, for our uh, the way we th think about employing equipment, the, the the equipment we operate, how we train our people. So so all of those tell me that we're doing some things right, and and in a you know, in a in a less resource constrained time, there are areas that clearly I would uh, like to see grow. But but that's that's for the wider conversation around the integrated review, the refresh of the integrated review. What do you think should be included in that refresh of the integrated review and the subsequent revision of the defence command paper? Well, I we're, we're doing a, a, a refresh because of. Not because the integrated review that was published uh, last year, so the spring of 2021, had any uh, shortcomings. Uh, actually, as I go around the world, as I speak to my counterparts and government officials from other countries, and particularly around NATO, that uh, the integrated review as, as published, uh, so, so uh, Global Britain in a Competitive Age, is widely regarded as a as a as a, uh, a, a, a best-in-class uh, demonstration of, of how a government positions itself in a, a security and defence context in, a, in an uncertain world, and it's in, in the title, and in an era of strategic competition. So, and I think everything that's happened since then in, the, uh, in, in Europe with the invasion of Ukraine, uh, with China being more assertive, taking a more bullying stance in, in, with its, uh, with its re regional neighbours, you know, all, all of those, the continued uh, toxic ideology underpinning violent extremism, all of those were highlighted in the integrated review. And I think where the bit where we were probably most taken aback was the speed with, with which they have come to, uh, come to pass. It, the, the ink was barely dry on, on the integrated review in, in, in 2021, when Russia first threatened invading Ukraine, and then subsequently we saw this year that, that brutal invasion. You know, the, Russia was called out as the most pressing threat in the integrated review, but things have happened so quickly. So I think uh, it's, it's right that we, have a, that we take a stock check. I think the government is, has been very clear that, that the, the threats that we face means that they will need to be an increase in defence funds uh, and that's what the purpose of the, inter the work going on to, on the refresh next year over the, over the course of 2023 will lead to a revision of uh, 
of defence funding, an increase in funding to reflect a more dangerous, uncertain world, and, and with that, making sure we've right-sized the, the armed forces for that. I mean, will that be a meaningful refresh if you have general election coming up? Yes, I, I, do, I do absolutely believe it will be, because uh, whilst there's a, clearly there's a, there's a, there's a political sign-off, it's driven by the Prime Minister, this is the, um, the, the, the work is the result of academic input, industry, uh, uh, defence and security uh, officials, uh, military leaders, so it, it is a comprehensive review. Now, of course, a, any, any government, uh, any change of government means a review of priorities and a review of um, spending priorities in particular. But the, but the essence of, of the integrated review, the essence that the world is a more dangerous place, that there are more challenges that are manifesting in ways that we need to be prepared for, and that ambition for the UK to be a problem-solving, burden-sharing nation, active on the world stage, you know, these, these, are, these are principles that uh, we can be very proud of as, a, as a, a way that Britain is positioned as a, you know, as a net contributor to global security and uh, global stability. And if we're talking about reviews, you led on the goal of net zero 2040 for the RAF. You spoke about that here last yeah. year. If you look at the performance, review your performance over the last year, how do you think it's going for the RAF, but also for aviation more generally? I, it, I think it's a really, it's a really positive story, and we have had some really genuinely exciting milestone stones over the, the last year. I think the one, the one that I am. There's, I mean, there, there, is, there, is, there have been some great achievements. The one I'm most pleased about is a conversation that we started with, our, with my fellow defence uh, air, air chiefs uh, from around the world, who all immediately saw the value of what we were doing and were keen to join in. So we've established a, a um, Global Air Chiefs Climate Change Initiative. Uh, and this summer, over 40 air chiefs signed up to that. And it's and effectively, it's a giant information sharing pool where where this is a transnational challenge. It is a transnational threat to our security, and and broadly, we face the same challenges as air forces. So to have a a a, a conglomeration of air forces, large and small, you know, USAF all the way down to some of the small island air forces. Th those are, uh, you know, that's, that's a hugely rewarding international leadership role for the Royal Air Force. We've had some uh, significant technical successes from flying the, the world's first piloted uh, aircraft with synthetic fuel, which is fuel that was made from hydrogen captured from the, uh, the atmosphere, carbon captured from the atmosphere, uh, it's an electrofuel, so catalysts heat, pressure, outcomes, petrol. Um, and it, and it, it sounds like alchemy, and it is alchemy, um, but, it's, uh, but it works, and, and we're continuing to pursue that. We've, we've done the same with another synthetic fuel process and flown a drone with that. And then a couple of weeks ago, we flew one of our voyages entirely of waste cooking oil. Now, it's been done before with, uh, with aircraft with isolated fuel systems where they've flown on one of their two engines or one of their four engines. This was the first time where every bit of fuel in that aircraft had been, had previously been cooking oil or, you know, or, or equivalent and it had been recycled and, and, we, uh, and we flew a test flight. And um, th these, are, th these are leadership steps that the Royal Air Force is taking which send a signal, it's in, exactly in step with what the UK government is doing through the Department of Transport and um, uh, and Bays uh, through their Jet Zero initiative to, to get net zero transatlantic flight, um, and and we're in and and there's an opportunity, there's a prosperity opportunity for the UK to lead in in this technology. I'm really pleased that the Air Force is leading the way in that, but there is a I freely admit there's a that you know, there's, there's a self-interested part in this as well. And the self-interested part is that if we can address our energy needs, if we can 
find a way of powering our bases, powering our deployments, powering our aircraft using renewable energy sources, energy sources that are produced at the point of use. That has untold operational value. That whole energy supply chain, that whole, uh, the, 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 you'll remember it from Afghanistan, the, the endless miles of convoys of fuel tankers that, that where with drivers putting their lives at risk day in, day out. You know, all of those things could become something of the past and we need to we need to sort of not constrain our imagination by having to go to the petrol pump every every thousand miles. Um, yeah, and, and these these are this is where, as I say, a self interested operational resilience aspect of net zero suddenly uh, opens up all sorts of new opportunities. Um, and you know, and the technology is there now, and it's just a matter of scaling it. That was a long answer, sorry. That, that, that was fascinating. I did, I did the lecture last year. And, so and I'm, just, I'm, I'm keeping one eye on the clock because I think in a few minutes we're going to start taking Q&A from here in the audience but also online. But there's a couple more questions that I had. I mean, you've talked a lot about leadership and the importance of that. And you put your name to, I think it was a 29, 2019 MOD report, looking into inappropriate behaviour within the armed forces, looking at allegations of bullying, of discrimination, of harassment, how those were dealt with. And your review then concluded, we have to do better. Given the recent stories about those kind of inappropriate behaviours within not just the services mm. and not just the RAF, but including the RAF, yes. even within the, the Red Arrows, what still needs to be done now to address those issues? It, it is, uh, I mean, as, as I sort of identified in 2019, and, I'm, and other, other people have done other similar reports into behaviours in different organisations, but the report I did in, j just before I became chief, I, it, to me it was clear that we, we weren't doing enough as an organisation across the Ministry of Defence to, to prevent uh, inappropriate, unacceptable behaviour uh, happening in the first place. And then we were not doing, we were certainly not doing well enough to uh, deal with the consequences of it, particularly for the victims. And, and that was, that came out very clear to me. So there was an issue, there was a sort of upstream issue, which is change the culture. There was a downstream issue of deal with it better. And there was a, and that dealing with it better meant that people who were victims, who had been harmed, had, had, had lost faith in the organisation that should be looking after them actually do anything about it and that was very painful to me and it's something that has um, that has shaped my approach to being chief of the air staff remembering you know, hearing testimony from victims and I, th I, I think I got a very small insight uh, to something that was actually done on a much larger scale last year by Sarah Atherton or this, into this year by Sarah Atherton um, where she called for evidence through the, uh, through the House of Commons Defence Committee and um, that, that upstream bit, that, that, that cultural change, it, it is cultures. It's, it's, a, it's something that does take years, but that, and, and, you know, and that's recognised that it's a journey of years. But sometimes when you say that it's a journey of years, that's an excuse for people to say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. It'll, it's the next person's job. And somewhere you've got to make, you've got to make a start. And, I think my, the headline I would say about inappropriate behaviours, it, it is about the determination of the leadership to change the culture. And, and that determination then sets the tone into the organisation. It might take a few years to rattle its way down the organisation, but that determination and that consistent determination to change the culture. And, and then it needs, it just needs that uh, you know, authentic leadership. So it has to, not only as it has to be talking the talk, it, 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 there has to be evidence that, that, that it's meaningful. It has to be relentless uh, repetition of, of the message and very and clear communications. And with that, uh, we will make the changes we need to. I, I, you know, for this audience, and there are, there are some colleagues in here, you know, the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of people in the armed forces are good people who do amazing things for our country. But there are still pockets where people are behaving as they, sh you know, not as they should, not to our standards, 
and, it, and people are getting harmed as a result. And I, you know, the, the leadership it does come from the top, and I, and I do credit Ben Wallace, and people have heard me talk about this as well before, but Ben Wallace has been absolutely clear and very decisive in the way that he has introduced new policies, he has brought it, you know, it was his leadership that brought in a, a zero tolerance and presumption of exit for any inappropriate behaviours of a, of a sexual nature that was or unacceptable behaviour of a sexual nature that was a uh, policy that was incorporated last month but announced in July. We've got the Defence Serious Crimes Unit that was launched today, again all of these driven by Ben Wallace. He meets the, uh, the women and gender networks regularly. He, he, is, he, he is absolutely demonstrating clearly his determination to change the culture and, and that's something that my fellow chiefs and I and, and down as the organisation are determined to continue to, to get after. It, it is disappointing, frustrating when it happens. At the end of it is somebody who's been harmed, who is somebody who is excluded, who is not able to give their all, who feels that they no longer have a part in the organisation. We lose at every level when people are, you know, behave below the standard expected. And so it, it must be a, a high priority for, and again, I've said this before, it, 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 it impacts our effectiveness as a fighting force because we lose our reputation for professionalism and discipline as, as, a, as a fighting force. And, and frankly, it, it turns people off from wanting to join us, um, particularly parents and, and community leaders who look at some of the the stories and to say, well, that's not a place for you, you know, young, you know, um, and and so we're, we're harmed at many levels on, above the the actual individual harm to to individuals. So this is absolutely something worth going after. And you, you mentioned the red arrows. We we were we were very clear. We 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 became aware of uh, standards behaviours below the standard expected. We investigated, and and uh, five, five people were sanctioned, including um, uh, dismissals from the service. And you know, and, and the team has turned a corner. Uh, and and I have absolute admiration for what the team has done just over the last month in the in the Middle East, uh, engaging with governments, engaging with uh, society across countries in in the Middle East, uh, and they they have done it whilst dealing with a, a significant turmoil as they've come to terms with you know, what has gone on in the past. But that is a better team, without a shadow of a doubt, a better team now. Thank you. And I have 20 more questions, but I've run out of time for mine. So it is your turn now. The Q&A is on the record. Um, for those online, do use the Q&A function on Zoom. And Dr. David Jordan, the co-director of the Freeman Air and Space Institute, is collating those online questions. If you're here in the room and have a question, put your hand up. And um, first question. It used to be the uh, it used to be the case with the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy, uh, as well as the British Army, that it. Uh, those forces were uh, sort of a copy of the British Army, uh, of the of the U.S. Army and re reflective armed forces, just a slightly smaller one, slightly. Uh, however, in the uh, in the recent years, uh, in all of those forces, certain changes that uh, were made that no longer reflect uh, the uh, uh, the wide range, the wide array of capabilities of those forces uh, in the U.S. Uh, in the case of the Royal Air Force, uh, there are no longer uh, for any long-range strategic bombers. Uh, there are no longer uh, uh, air superiority fighters, and uh, this affects the capabilities of the Royal Air Force. How uh, would you? Uh, how concerned would you be uh, with those changes uh, of those uh, capabilities of the Royal Air Force? How do those changes affect uh, its uh, its position in the world? And one last little question, uh, how concerned are you with a recent uh, use of Kinjal, uh, the dagger uh, uh, missile uh, by the Russian Federation in Ukraine, uh, a hypersonic missile that has been used successfully in Ukraine and the United Kingdom does not have any means of countering it? How would you uh, refer to that? Thank you. 
That was, that was two, possibly three, gusting, gusting four questions there. But I, um, and, and if I may, um, and I absolutely get the, the thrust of your question, but I will challenge you on, uh, on air superiority fighter. We've got one of the best air superiority fighters in the world with, with Typhoon. And when we put the electronically scanned radar in it, it will go up another level of technology. When we link it into the E7 wedge tail, we will be r right there at the cutting edge of um, uh, sorry, the wedge tail airborne early warning aircraft. Um, we'll be right there at the cutting edge of air dominance, air superiority. But I think the, your wider point is, is, is well made. And, and, and it goes back to that, that, that point I made earlier, that we do exist in a, in a resource-constrained environment. We have to recognise that there are other pressures on, on our government's spending. We can't be everything that we would wish to be. Uh, uh, and, and that goes for the Navy and that goes for the Army. But as a, as a benchmark Air Force, there is no doubt in my mind that we, for the, uh, for the money that is spent, uh, for the force you get from that, for the, for the concepts and doctrine that we develop, for the new technologies that we field, I think most Air Forces in the world, and probably Stanfast China, most Air Forces in the world recognise that they're not going to be able to emulate the United States. I, 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 was, I was privileged to be at the B-21 radar rollout on Friday. It, it is unlike anything that we are going to field any time, you know, any, any time, any, any time soon. Um, yeah, the, the billions of pounds that has been spent on that to get that, you know, to get that into, into a, you know, to be rolled out. However, air forces like the Royal Air Force, like, like the French Air Force, that are, are, are air forces that uh, work at another level, and, and we are able to project ourselves globally. We demonstrate day in, day out the utility of air power and increasingly space power across many of, of the roles. We can't do everything, but, but by goodness me, we contribute to the UK's place in the world and we contribute to the UK's security and the UK's prosperity as well through our amazing in, industrial base, aerospace industrial base. Your point about uh, hypersonic missiles and um, the defence of the UK. Well, we are part of NATO, and NATO uh, is in part there to defend it and, and is developing means to defend against these missiles. It is developing technology. It is absolutely something that we are all concerned about because of the threat, because of the... Um, Whereas a ballistic missile is predictable and is relatively easy to defend against, a, a manoeuvring hypersonic missile is an entirely different level of technological challenge to be able to defend against, and that's where it has uh, you know, it is of concern to all of us. And I think we should be we we should recognise that that what Russia achieved in in Ukraine. Uh, on its first night, it, uh, it had um, over a dozen strategic bombers airborne, over a, uh, over 100 missiles in the air, uh, cruise missiles. It's capable of mass precision attack, and it is still capable of mass precision attack. And, and that is why uh, the, it is so important that Russia is defeated in Ukraine, that Ukraine prevails, because if Russia gets away with what it's doing in Ukraine, if it, it will come back for more, and it will come back for more, and I absolutely believe our our Baltic partners, countries like Poland, who are very clear of the threat that Russia presents today, and that is why the efforts of our government, of other governments, to uh, to ensure that the Ukraine that Ukraine survives, prevails, and um, yeah, and Russia fails. Well, you know that is that is about European security. It's about global security. So, continue, we, we we are working on how to defend against uh, you know, the hypersonic threat. It is a core Russian development program, Chinese as well, and uh, and it's something that that we will continually focus, you know, continue to focus on. Yeah. Let's take another question here. If we can bring the microphone across and maybe take. Two at once, so hand it over once you've asked your questions, because we're running out of time. Thank you. Um, so you were talking about uh, misconduct within the service. Well, there was a report about um, certain ex-RAF pilots training uh, Chinese pilots uh, to, 
you know, shoot down, I think it was, F-16s. Uh, so what, what, what do you, is that in your jurisdiction? And do tell me if the question is inappropriate. Uh, it's all right. Good. And let's just have the next question, then we'll group. So, um, you mentioned Trenchard. I'm just wondering what specific constants do you believe need to be maintained and you particularly value in the modern RAF? Would you say that again? Sorry. That's you mentioned Trenchard. I'm just wondering what specific constants you believe need to be maintained and what you particularly value. Yeah. Air so, Force. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll start with the, uh, the, the Chinese um, uh, air crew training. And um, without it sounding like I'm sloping shoulders, it wasn't just Royal Air Force uh, fast jet pilots. Um, and it was actually a, a multinational problem. And the first international arrest has actually been made of a United States Marine Corps Harrier pilot um, who uh, has been extradited back to the United States and is fa facing trial. Um, so it is, a, it is an issue for all of us. I, uh, we, we, we condemned it in the clearest terms. It, uh, it, is, it is not appropriate that people that, that have been privy to some sensitive uh, Information might find themselves in a way that gives advantage to a to a potential adversary, and it, and whether that's China or any other uh, potential adversary, you know, the, the, all of these people signed up to the Official Secrets Act, and and that should be that should be enough. It, it their actions demonstrated that it wasn't enough, and that's why the National Security Bill will strengthen our ability to sanction people in, an, in, a, in, in a way, and we're exploring ways in which the National Security Bill can prevent this happening in future. So it, it, was, it was down to some very aggressive recruiting through second and third parties, some of those who I genuinely believe didn't realise what, what, what they were part of. Um, but ultimately, um, it's, it's been called out publicly, and it's the right thing to do. Um, and as I say, it wasn't just a Royal Air Force fast jet problem. The, the culture, I, 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 the culture question is, is, uh, goes back to what I think I said earlier. The, you know, whilst our uniform hasn't changed much since the, you know, the 1920s, 1930s, um, actually that's inconsequential to my mind and, and um, you know, uh, good luck to somebody who might look to change it in the, in the future. Actually, what what, uh, what what Trenchard set in place was that air-minded culture, that that culture of difference, that culture of air power being decisive of itself, but being the uh, decisive enabler of activities in the land and maritime <coughs> environments. That need for a uh, a group of people who were advocates of this uh, of this amazing new technology. Now, the technology of flight is now no longer an amazing new technology, but there are new things coming along that we are equally the advocates for. We are at the cutting edge of so many of the technologies that the British Defence Forces are are um, are fielding now, and we will continue to be so. And that that innovative DNA. Is, uh, is at the heart of that culture. And I think it's that that I would say is, is the thing that we have to uh, uh, preserve. Uh, and we, we occasionally have to wake it up as well, uh, wake up that sleepy DNA when we forget that we should be innovative. Uh, and I, but I'm delighted to say that we are being pretty innovative at the moment and doing some really exciting things across the, the range of air and space power. And to check on online questions now. Yes, we have several. Um, I don't think we'll have time to get through all of them. So apologies to the online uh, participants. But um, let me start with a question relating to the B-21. There have been a couple of questions asked by um, Tony Osborne and uh, Mike Harwood about this. Um, Tony Osborne uh, asks about the uh, nature of the B-21 capability. He says that as a nation which gave up a bomber capability, do we think that capability is still relevant? Well, Mike, Harbour, uh, Mike Harwood sorry, asks, um, was there any particular reason why the USAF Chief of Staff wanted both the UK and Australians present at the B-21 unveiling? Was there any subliminal messaging going on there? Well, I, think, I think Mike Harwood's question is probably one for, uh, for Chief Brown. Um, but uh, I, I think there was clearly a, a message in that the Australian Chief and I were were privy to, to that uh, to the unveiling. 
and and we and we we all recognise the role of a long-range strategic bomber, and we are very fortunate indeed to have partners like the United States, like the United States Air Force, where we are interchangeable in so many ways with with what they what they do and how they operate. It it is a role that we that we used to have as an Air Force. Uh, we we led the world in it, um, both in the Second World War and the immediate aftermath, and with the with the V bombers that uh, that emerged in the uh, immediate aftermath of the Second World War. It goes back to that that earlier question. There are there are some things that I would like to do, but but in this you know it, you know I have to operate within you know within the resources I'm given, and um, and the, uh, the the phenomenal capability of that as a war fighting platform um, is finally balanced against the significant cost of it, the significant unit cost of it. Um, but it is something, needless to say, that we and the Australians are closely engaged with, and we will continue to be so, and, you know, and that's to the, uh, and, and in that respect, the, uh, you know, that, 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 re that relationship with, with the United States, particularly around the the potential threats to security in the Indo-Pacific region is you know, speaks to why we have a live conversation about the rollout of that capability. Thank you. And uh, a question from Catherine Courtney relating to space, or a two-part question in many ways. She notes that um, the Russians have taken the view that commercial satellites providing intelligence, uh, particularly for war crimes, um, they've taken the view that this makes commercial platforms uh, potentially legitimate military targets, which obviously is a view open to considerable debate, I suspect. Um, but she wonders what the military's responsibility for ensuring the ongoing sustainability of the space environment might look like, and how commercial assets might be protected from hostile attack uh, by nations that have chosen to see them as part of the en enemy's ISR nexus. That, that those are amazing questions, and and Sophie, if you were looking for ideas for the chief's presentation next year, I think, I think that would that would be a good basis for it. The um, I will try and be very brief. The there is a whole new field of, and, and actually it starts with academic uh, understanding and, and uh, discussions. And I know that we've got uh, fellows here who are working at who are looking at these aspects, but uh, understanding about deterrence in space, understanding how the laws of armed conflict and international humanitarian law apply to space, how that very important link between commercial satellite services and, and military use and operational use, how that affects that calculus. Um, uh, but uh, whilst, we, you know, whilst we talk about uh, from our perspective, getting our heads around the law of armed conflict and international humanitarian law, and then when you look at what Russia is doing to the civilian infrastructure in Ukraine today, you know, taking down power, water, denying the population those fundamental uh, uh, um, the fundamental ability to live, uh, the, the, all all of that uh, speaks to the challenge of of being up against a ruthless, reckless adversary, there is a risk that a, uh, a detonation in space could cause a chain reaction of debris clouds which, which actually deny huge element, huge parts of space that we rely on in our day-to-day our -day lives for, for everything, um, you know, from getting food on the shelves to uh, petrol in the, in the pumps to cash in our, uh, you know, cash in our bank accounts. The, the the risks now to to space the risks to a a, a uh, an open and resilient sp space domain where everybody can benefit it from it are so great now that it requires organisations like the Royal Air Force like the Ministry of Defence to really take it seriously and to think through how we can understand what is going on what our potential adversaries the nefarious actors in space are doing think through how we can protect what we do in space uh, better and ultimately be ready to defend in space. Um, it, it, it is a rich seam of, um, of, of work you know, for, for us as 
military concepts um, uh, and and doctrine, um, you know, thinking through those aspects, um, and also you know, from an on the academic side, the, the theoretical aspects of it. So it's a it's a it's a fascinating topic, and there's a lot more we've got to understand. So having an air and space institute is quite a useful it is, thing. Indeed. I fear we have run out of time, um, unless we're allowed to go over. Yeah. I think we probably run the risk of uh, causing all sorts of problems, so um, I think I'll just apologise again to uh, those who ask questions online, um, which we're not able to put um, to give them to give their questions sufficient justice in the answer and hand back to you. Um. Thank you, Sir Mike. Thank you all for braving the cold, for being here in person. Thank you to all of those watching online. Thank you. Um, I would conclude uh, by thanking all of you um, for coming this evening uh, and joining us. Obviously, I'd repeat um, the thanks that Wynne gave at the start to uh, Caroline for uh, leading the discussion and to uh, the Chief of the Air Staff for uh, giving us his frank views on a variety of things um, and tackling the questions with, with such candour uh, and offering us uh, such great insights and uh, we're very grateful to the ongoing support um, that we've received at the Freeman Air and Space Institute uh, since, we, since we were established in the midst of a pandemic which is not the best way of doing face-to-face -face events we discovered fairly quickly but thank you for all that support. Um, I'll draw the evening uh, to a conclusion now by saying that uh, for those of you uh, who are joining us for the reception, if you come in through, and forgive me, I'm going to do the fire exit uh, thing, if you come in through the doors at the back, which you came in through, please, um, and you'll be guided out to there. To those of you who aren't joining us, uh, again, many thanks for uh, your attendance, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. But I uh, would conclude by asking you to join with me in thanking both Caroline and Sir Mike.